Sorry, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to tell you about uh, the work that I've been kind of working, uh, that I've been doing over the past few years. Um, and uh, yeah, let's kind of dive right in. So I like to start with PG comics. <laughs> Basically, the dark matter is a problem of both particle physics and astrophysics. For the longest time, particle physicists have been trying to understand the origin of dark matter by looking at smaller and smaller scales and building models of dark matter. And I'm guilty of some of that. <laughs> and then on the other hand, astrophysicists have been looking at the large scale structure in the effects of dark matter on formation of galaxies, for example. Uh, and I've been guilty of that too. But at the end of the day, the essence of this is that it's a problem really that kind of tackles both sides. And I think a better understanding of astrophysics and particle physics is really a good way forward to making progress in the field. So this talk is about how to map out the dark matter phase space distribution in galactic scales at key locations. So there are a lot of words here that I would like to explain. So by phase space distribution, I really mean like the velocity distribution and the density distribution. And the reason that I'm thinking more about galactic scales is really for two uh, important reasons. One is because our experiments happen here on Earth. So we are affected by the dark matter phase space distribution really locally. And that's how we understand our results and that's how we can figure out if we, if we discover dark matter. On the other hand, deviations from you know, the standard lambda CDM paradigm really do happen at galactic scales because at very large scales, everything seems to be working more or less okay. So that's why it's quite crucial to use new tools to understand what dark matter is doing in basically in the Milky Way. So the way that I'd like to approach this is by using astrophysics tools to answer particle physics questions. So I will, as I will show you today, I'll be using hydrodynamic simulations. So these are cosmological simulations that take into account baryons. And a lot of them are zooming simulations of the Milky Way. So we can kind of understand mergers, for example, like you just see here. Uh, then we'll be using results from Gaia, which is a space telescope that gave us the largest kinematic catalog of stars um, in history, which is quite incredible. And we match this with ground space telescopes. For example, this is a picture of the Magellan telescopes to understand the chemical properties of these stars and correlating those with the kinematics really is going to kind of give us an idea of the origin of some of these stars and some of these mergers. And all of this is going to get explained a bit later. So what I would like to kind of discuss today is really explore three different examples, uh, the solar neighborhood, the galactic center and dwarf galaxies, and how we can use stars or the motion and kinematics of stars as, as these three different locations to have a better understanding of dark matter. In particular for the example that I'm going to be using here for the solar neighborhood is that of direct detection of WIMPs and how it's important to understand the velocity distribution of dark matter um, in the solar neighborhood to be able to have the robust results from direct detection. Indirect detection, for example, from the galactic center is very important. And it's very important for us to understand the density of dark matter in the galactic center to be able to make solid uh, conclusions from the indirect detection, uh, from indirect detection. Similarly with dwarf galaxies, but also go and delving into the core versus cusp problem and having uh, non-standard non dark matter models. Uh, for example, dissipation in dwarf galaxies, does that really help explain or not a lot of these strategies? So let's start with the solar neighborhood. Dark detection, <laughs> as you know, is just you have a xenon atom and then dark matter properly colored comes in, hits that xenon atom, creates a lot of scintillation light. We detect that scintillation light and that's how we know dark matter was there. Fortunately, of course, we haven't seen any of this. But something that is very important is that how fast the dark matter is going really determines how much scintillation light there is. So this process, the rate for this process does depend on two astrophysics, um, uh, two astrophysics quantities, the local dark matter density and the local dark matter velocity distribution. So although the local dark matter density has been kind of a question in physics and has been explored over pretty much a hundred years really, the local velocity distribution of dark matter has not really had that same treatment. 
And in particular, since the 80s, we've been assuming that it's a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And the way that you actually get the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is if you assume that the system is in equilibrium and it's isotropic. And I can tell you that <laughs> the Milky Way definitely is not equilibrated and it's not isotropic. So what we really want to do is build an empirical strategy that takes into account the formation of the Milky Way itself, and in particular, actually the position of the sun to understand how fast the dark matter is going really, really close to us. To do that, I have a three-step program where from simulations, I'm going to show you that I can correlate the velocity of dark matter to the velocity of the stars. And really the key word here is actually some of the dark matter to some of the stars, and we're going to get through that. Then we can use such correlation to measure the phase space distribution map of the stars in Gaia and put these together to end up with a, <clears throat> excuse me, with an empirically uh, local phase space, uh, empirically obtained local phase space distribution of dark matter. So the kind of logic here is to reconstruct dark matter from the distribution of the stars. And the way that I do this is actually really based on velocities, but let's do it in for like the spatial density just because it's an easier kind of visualization. So if I was to let's take a look at uh, one of the simulations and the density of dark matter, it's gonna look like this. And you see that it has a lot of structure when this is what, just one of our simulations. Then for some of these structures, Actually, for example, it is going to be what we call a subhalo. So, you know, this highest density is where your galaxy is going to live, but there is a lot of structure around it. If we were to overlay the stellar density map, we will see that there is some kind of cross match between the overdensities of stars and the overdensities of dark matter. So, but here, this is just in physical space. And what I would like to actually focus on is the correlation between the velocity of the stars and the velocities of dark matter. So the idea here, the whole goal, is that I end up with different components of, um, of uh, merging stellar components in dark matter. And then all of these components have their own velocities and they match a dark matter component. So in other, way, in other words, that if this is my speed distribution, I will have a component that I'm going to call the old halo. And this is the dark matter that has dark matter and stars that have merged in prior to edge of three, so a very, very long time ago. Then I have a new merger that is called the sausage. Uh, unfortunately, the person who discovered it, I guess, was very hungry, called it the sausage. <laughs> and it has, and then we understand like it, it is a merger that has happened somewhere between six and 10 billion years ago. And it's quite prominent in the solar neighborhood. And what we want is to, um, it, it, from simulations, I will show you that this, the distribution of the star velocities of the stars and velocities of dark matter actually match. And then there is Nix, which is a, a younger cell stream that um, I will discuss in a little bit. So basically from simulations here, I can take a look at all the dark matter and the stars that have merged in close to the solar neighborhood prior to Redshift 3, a long time ago, and look at their velocity distribution. And from simulations, it actually shows that they have similar, that their distributions are actually the same. And the reason that this happens is basically the, these distributions are actually Gaussian with a pro, more or less the same, um, the same dispersion, which means that these distributions really have had enough time to uh, become isotropic and in equilibrium because they happened such a long time ago. If you put these together, you end up with something very close to Maxwell Boltzmann actually. So here, what I'm showing you is that dark matter and stars that have merged in a long time ago actually have the same kinematics. The way that I would like you to think for, uh, uh, to think why this is the case is because you can imagine dark matter and stars are both collisionless. They came in with the same initial conditions, more or less. They came in at the same time. They're only affected un under gravity. So it makes sense that they land more or less around the same place. Of course, there are high order effects and everything that I'm happy to discuss later, but this is kind of like the essence of this idea here. 
Then we take a look at more recent mergers. For example, this is the merger of the sausage, which is somewhere between redshift one and three. And in simulations, we were not really trying to reproduce these um, uh, mergers exactly the same, but we found actually a laundry list of mergers uh, around that same kind of time scale that where the dark matter and the stars actually do follow quite each other quite well. And some of them have this double peak structure. This is a very specific type of orbit that is highly eccentric, which is what the Gaia sausage actually does or something very similar. So we do expect that the dark matter is going to uh, follow the same kind of trend as the Gaia sausage. And I'm happy to discuss, I know I'm going quite fast over this, but I'm happy to discuss details uh, later if you want to stick around or if you have questions. Finally, there is NIST. And this is a new structure that my collaborators and I actually discovered back in 2019. And Basically, this is a collection of spars that have a very interesting motion where it's prograde, which means it's kind of sort of co-rotating with the disk, but it's going inwards. And now I'd like to actually spend some time and discuss this new structure with you. But before that, the, I want to explain the full logic is that if the dark matter and stars have the same velocities, then you can use the velocity of the stars to actually end up with the velocity of the dark matter. However, these mergers that I'm discussing do not contribute the same amount of stars as they do dark matter. So you do have to do some proper rescaling because basically every object has a different mass to light ratio. Some of them are dark matter dominated. Some of them have like a more, uh, a more balanced, balanced <laughs> uh, dark matter versus star ratio. And we have to take that into account. So we use some, we use uh, abundance matching. Basically we use uh, uh, empirical properties of these mergers and subhalos to try to extract how much dark matter is coming in from where. The final distribution, and this is a speed distribution here uh, is what I'm showing you where Red is the old mergers, and this is from data. So the red is the old mergers. Blue is this Gaia sausage here. And through these empirical relations, we found that the contribution of this Gaia sausage is about 42% with very large error bars. Um, and then we put these together, we end up with this speed distribution here, which is quite different from the Maxwell Boltzmann that we usually assume. And in particular, it's actually a lot slower. How does this affect direct detection? Well, it affects the actual limits just because the speed distribution is different. It also impacts different experiments differently because every experiment is sensitive to a different range of velocities. Uh, of course, it's also different for different operators, theoretical operators, and it affects yearly modulation. But I will just focus on the first point, uh, as you can see that we, uh, just to kind of get this point across about how important it is to get the right local velocity distribution. So for direct detection, I'm just here plotting the speed distribution from the previous slide without the error bars, just to simplify the plot. And in dashed gray here, I have the standard halo model. The rate, as I discussed earlier, is dependent on the density, but also on this integral of f of v over v, where this integral starts at a minimum velocity that depends on the threshold of the experiment and the dark matter mass. This is basically for a certain dark matter mass, how slow can it get to actually knock off the xenon atom enough to have to be above threshold? You can understand how if it's moving way too slowly, it's not going to do anything. And the example I'm going to discuss here is that of xenon. So for a 10 GeV dark matter, the minimum velocity is going to be 567 kilometers a second, which means that for to calculate my rate, I'm integrating from this V min here all the way up. We usually sometimes do the up to the escape velocity, but that's a whole other discussion. So you can see here that if you initially assume the standard halo model or the Maxwellian, and then you realize that you have you know, that maybe that's not the right distribution, it's actually a different one, you might be losing in rate, especially at the 10 GeV dark matter, so for the low one. However, if you assume the 100 GeV dark matter, 
You remember velocity is only 95 kilometers a second. These two distributions are normalized to one. So you can see that there isn't really much of a difference. And which means that this is going to affect lower mass dark matter more than the higher mass dark matter. The plots that you've probably seen a million times, where here on the x-axis we have the dark matter mass, on the y-axis we have the dark matter scat uh, nucleon scattering cross-section, and everything above this black line here, for example, has been ruled out by xenon one ton. This line here is going to be changed, and, and this is my rendition of that line and making very simplistic assumptions. But basically, if I were to assume the Maxwell Boltzmann, I would end up excluding this parameter space. But if I were to assume, for example, this new distribution that I showed you, I will end up excluding this space. So you can see that it affects the lower mass, but really everything kind of converges at the higher mass. Something very important that I would like to reflect here is that it's not, um, I'm not saying that the distribution that I just showed you is the end game. And the reason for it is that it has, this is based on, you know, the presence of the Gaia sausage and the old mergers, but there are a lot of other mergers that we really need to take into account. But for example, one of these mergers is actually Nix. So Nix is a, uh, I got to name it, which is the coolest thing ever, which is a Greek goddess of the night. And the, these are the distributions here where the, in kinematic space, this is, uh, the, these are where the Nix stars live. Uh, this is an X and Y and X and Z. So I'm going to go through them one by one just to tell you where these stars live and, and mainly because I'm very attached to them now. <laughs> so kinematically, if I were to take a look at the disk stars, the disk stars of the Milky Way are going to have a co-rotate, like a rotation of about 220 kilometers a second. So it's about here, it would be five. But they're not going to have any radial motion which I kind of like think about as like a breathing mode. So they will be really living here at the center. Nix stars, however, have some kind of that co-rotation as well, but also have a radial velocity that is non-trivial, going averaging about 100 kilometers a second, which is quite strange, really, because you don't expect disk stars to do that. If I were to take a look at these stars kind of in X and Y, so within the plane of the Milky Way, the sun is actually moving this way and it's, it's going to a circle. And actually the arrow of the sun should be the same size as more or less as the arrow of these, um, of these stars. It's just that I wanted to kind of really show that. And if I were to overlay what the Milky Way is doing, the sun, which is a very boring young star is going to be rotating this way while these Nix stars are kind of co-rotating, but also kind of going through towards the center of the galaxy. And this is very intriguing. Similar, similarly, in the X and Z plane, you will see that these stars are actually moving towards the center of the galaxy, while you know the sun is actually going just that way. So what's going on here? Well, there are about two theories um, that would explain this. One is that a merger happened a long time ago that kind of hit the um, some the hit the Milky Way disk, and some of these stars got heated and put in a different orbit. So that could be possible, or that Nix is actually the remnant of a merger that basically something has hit the Milky Way and Nix is part of it. Interestingly enough. In one of our cosmological simulations, we actually have an event that looks a lot like this. And I'm gonna show it to you now, where this is the Milky Way, my version of the Milky Way is going to be rotating and something's going to hit it. So that's the Milky Way. And then you see that other galaxy just coming in, but because it came in to co-rotating, it kind of got dragged within that same motion, which is very interesting. So from astrophysics, or at least more astrophysically inclined, they were like, oh, OK, this is a very interesting because it, it really helps us understand the formation of the Milky Way. But from a more particle physics point of view, this will have very large implications on dark detection. So because this merger is supposed, it would have brought in with it a lot of dark matter that would have formed a dark disk. So really it's quite important to understand the origin of a merger like this. 
especially this whole dark disk story. I like the uh, Justin Reed's paper from 2008 that says, as satellites are torn apart by tidal forces, they deposit both their stars and their dark matter into a thick disk. The latter point is the key and new idea presented in this work. A dark matter disk must form in a lambda CDM cosmology. And really what I find interesting is the use of the words must form, kind of it makes this whole thing quite inevitable. So in a follow-up from also 2008, they actually studied the presence of this dark disk. So imagine if I had, and this I actually drew by hand because I don't have the actual distribution just yet. Um, and I wanna be careful about that. But if I have a co-rotating structure, it means that in heliocentric velocity, the distribution is going to be very close to zero because it's kind of co-rotating with us, right? Which means that if I were a dark matter at 10 GeV, I would not be affected by this new distribution. While if I was, 100 GeV dark matter, this will make quite a bit of a difference. So in this follow-up paper from 2008, uh, they took a look at direct detection limits of I think Xenon 100 at the time, uh, or Xenon 10. Uh, so where this, again, the x-axis dark matter mass, dark matter scattering cross-section, and let's focus on the black line here, where if you don't have any of this new dark disk situation, you end up with the usual lines that you're expecting. But if you have kind of a contribution from this co-rotating dark disk, and again, don't think of it as like the thin disk, just exactly the same, it's just, excuse me, co-rotating dark matter, basically, then the fraction of that co-rotation can actually affect quite a lot by orders of magnitude your uh, limits in the dark in the high mass of the dark matter. So there is a lot for us to do. Uh, we need to understand the origin of NICs. And the way that we do that is by using the ground telescopes that I told you about earlier to understand the chemical properties of these stars, because that would tell us where these stars actually came from. And we had a few observing nights, the data is being analyzed right now. And if indeed dark matter if indeed Nix is a merger, we need to understand how much dark matter has brought in with it here. Um, and if the dark matter is closely correlated in this particular case. Uh, uh, but also the last point here, which I have not discussed, is that this whole method that I've been suggesting only applies for dark matter that has, or mergers that have star companions. But you do expect that the presence of dark subhalos and those need to be taken into account as well. So before I get into the next part, I know that there was a lot <laughs> that I was going through. Uh, are there any questions? Let me pause here. Uh, maybe I'll ask a quick, quick question. Sure. Is, is there, so the, one of the largest uncertainties seems to be that ratio of uh, mm -hmm. stellar component to dark matter. Yeah. Is, is there a good way of actually quantifying that? Say we see a, a, a new stellar component with some specific phase space distribution. Yeah. Oh, so basically, uh, so you're asking is the systematic of the correlation between the dark matter velocities on top of each other? Like, is there yeah. a way? Yeah. So that's a good question. So the thing is like, we're doing all of this in simulations. And the reason that we didn't quantify that as much is because we were drowned by the systematics of like the mass to light ratio. So if we have a better understanding of, of that, then I think like right now, I thought that it wouldn't really make much of much sense to try to narrow that down <laughs> the, between the, if you're drowned by the, another effect. Um, in the simulation paper, we actually looked at different simulations, also like the, basically the ratio between the dark matter and the star velocities at different, you know, in different bins, also at different locations. So we can kind of quantify at least like, well, at least in the simulations, it, it was of the order, I think of 15%, 15% uh, up to, I think, 50% of the, uh, at the edges of difference there. Um, mm. 
and that's what we could see in the simulations. But again, yeah, it was much lower than the systematics of the ratio. Uh, and, and you didn't mention it here, but I know in the papers you talked a lot about metallicities and distinguishing yes. populations. Do you, do you want right. to say like one or two words about that? Yeah, so basically the way that we get the mass to light ratio is by using the metallicities of the stars. And the reason for that is because there is a very tight empirical relation between the metallicity of an object, like the average metallicity of the stars in an object and its stellar mass. So we go from the metallicity which we can measure to you know extracting how massive the object was when it merged into the Milky Way. Then from that, there is another empirical relation, which is which is what we call found by abundance matching, but basically it relates the stellar mass to the total halo mass. The problem with that one is that it's quite tight for like very, very massive galaxies, like you know, Milky Way sized and a bit below, maybe like large Magellanic cloud. But after that, for dwarfs and everything, it kind of like explodes <laughs> with uncertainties, which is why the uncertainty is very, very large right now. So any progress that the field can make with that, I think is going to go a long way in understanding these ratios. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't see any hands raised. OK, so we can kind of go forward. <clears throat> Basically, you might ask, for example, how does this work with self-interacting dark matter? Well, the correlation between the dark matter and the stars stops being true. <laughs> so that's already something. Um, and basically everything that we've discussed is not going to hold as much. And uh, in that case, we're trying to explore new um, observables in the cases of non uh, uh, of non standard lambda CDM because the correlation we can't use that correlation anymore. So moving on to the galactic center, basically, why do we care about the density of dark matter in the galactic center? Well, for indirect detection, which is dark matter, for example, annihilating or decaying in the center of the galaxy into standard model particles that we later detect, the pros is that we have a lot, a very high density of dark matter here. So we're going to see get C signal very quickly. The con is that there is also a lot of astrophysical backgrounds or a lot of things that we might not be able to understand. So here what I'd like to show you is just like a simple how all of this kind of put, is put in frame about a simple extension of the dark of the same model. So if I have if I add a single um, new electric electroweak triplet fermion at the TeV scale, what would happen? This dark matter signal, for example, can annihilate into well, into recalling jets and everything, but it also can emit gamma rays. And these gamma rays can be seen by ground tearing off telescopes, for example, HESS. So the rate of my signal, is, signal um, is going to depend on the flux of the dark matter, experimental efficiency, and of course, how long we're exposed for. But the way that I would like to break this down is by theoretical uncertainties of this process, which actually involves a lot of loops and it's a really, really difficult thing to calculate. The experimental uncertainties well, uh, uh, that are related just to the telescope and the astrophysical uncertainties. So for theoretical uncertainties, <laughs> and you can see where this is going already, um, the effect is actually about 10%. And the reason that I actually show this particular example is because I know a few people on these papers who, and I know how much they struggle to calculate these loop diagrams and they did an amazing job bringing down the theoretical uncertainties down to just 10%. Our experimental friends have also done an amazing job in, uh, in figuring out what is the effect of the systematics on uh, the limits that we get in, for example, Hess, and they, put that at about 25%. Astrophysical uncertainties is about 50,000%. <laughs> it's a lot, is what I'm trying to say. And this is why I think it's really, really important that we finally do something and do our friends a favor who are doing such an amazing job and at least like meet them halfway and <laughs> get a bit better at this. And the reason for it is because we don't understand the density profile of dark matter at the center of the galaxy. So if I were to take a look at uh, how much dark matter in my flux that we expect there, it's going to depend on 
the square of the density profile. And the density profile is here. So this is the density as a function of radius. And you might see a lot of these different profiles in the literature, kind of W, Ignasto, Burkert. <clears throat> The fact that we just know so little about this makes our experimental friends actually kind of, excuse me, make plots like this, where on the uh, x-axis I have the dark matter mass, on the y-axis I have the dark matter scattering cross-section, and this spiky thing, this is the theoretical limit, and then these more or less horizontal lines really are the different assumptions about what this density profile looks like. So for example, if I were to assume that I had a core, a core distribution of a size of two kiloparsecs, then everything above this blue line here, everything about this theoretical line above the blue line is going to be ruled out, which means that I'm ruling out more or less dark matter from two to three TeV. However, if I assume an Inasto profile, everything above this orange line is ruled out and I can rule out everything below 10 TeV. So there is quite a huge variance here in what I can assume. The goal here is to understand this density profile distribution. It can vary by orders of magnitude, especially here, and we really need to narrow that down. The way we can do that, for example, is by measuring the escape velocity of the stars, because that gives us a, a kind of a hint onto the Milky Way potential and from the Milky Way potential, we can deduce the dark matter density profile. I will not show you today, at the end of this talk, I will not show you a new distribution here, unfortunately, because I'm waiting for Gaia, the full Gaia DR3 in early 2022 to be able to at least get some kind of make some progress here. But I'm going to show you how we can use the escape velocity measurement. We can make a robust measurement of the escape velocity and how that can affect the mass of the Milky Way. This is just to show you that different profiles will have a different escape velocity. This is distance r, and this is the escape velocity. And you can see that if you change uh, the profile, you end up with different distributions. OK, so how can we determine the escape velocity, which if you remember, uh, mechanics is basically can be related to square root of two twice times the potential that you're in. You can imagine, this is just mock data, you can imagine that you have a distribution that drops at a certain point. The escape velocity is going to be usually, you would expect, that all the stars are going to be bound below that limit. However, you might have outlier stars. Stars are just not bound, they're just like kind of zipping right through. So what you want is to, to fit for this escape velocity. And what has been done since the 1990s is to really fit it with this profile of V escape minus V to the K. And what you're looking for is V escape and K. There are a lot of issues <laughs> and complications. First, you need to take into account the errors and people have done that. And the presence of outliers, uh, which are these guys here uh, that you need to model as well. And people have done that too. But the thing that I think that struck me a lot is the fact that we did not take into account the fact that you might have different kinematic substructure. And in particular, if you don't have, uh, um, for example, this whole sausage story. So let me exemplify that. Imagine if oh, I have, so I have my outliers here, so that's not a problem. This is my full distribution. But my, if my distribution has actually two different components, the sausage here and then the halo, you can see that if I have, if I'm trying to fit this whole blue line with a single distribution, I might not get the right K or V escape. While if I incre increase my minimum velocity here, I am indeed dominated by a single distribution and everything works out fine. Most people in the literature just use a quite low minimum velocity to increase statistics, but that really biases the results. And in a couple of weeks, hopefully I'll put out the papers and show you exactly why, <laughs> or at least by how much this can happen. So what I did is using Gaia DR2, make sure to model this with multiple components and do this in a robust way. And what I end up with, and this is uh, basically the mass, the total mass of the Milky Way, assuming an NFW result, in, the, in gray here, these are previous measurements. <clears throat> 
and you can see here that they tend to be quite, quite a bit high, though decent at all of 2019 is the, uh, is the most recent, um, is a bit lower. While the measurements that I found are quite robust, uh, and in particular actually using multiple functions to fit this whole process, three functions, two functions with a higher minimum velocity, one function at a much higher minimum velocity, and they're more or less consistent with, the, they're definitely consistent with each other, but they're also consistent with decent at all. The thing is, this is the most robust um, measurement. And it has, it's really telling us that the mass of the Milky Way, the total mass of the Milky Way is actually a bit lower than people have estimated in the past. But again, it's consistent with the latest measurements that the reason that we're kind of very proud of this work is because it's kind of tackles this, this thing from a much more robust perspective. And I'm happy to kind of talk more about the details uh, afterwards. Anywho, in Gaia DR3, uh, oh, I, I didn't update this in 2021. It's actually 2022 now. <laughs> um, we will be able to uh, hopefully kind of build the escape velocity at different radii and actually get the density profile of the dark matter. Finally, and very quickly, I will kind of go through uh, a couple things about dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are fun. We have quite a few of them and we're discovering a lot more now. And in particular, if I were to plot the circular velocity of one of these dwarf galaxies as a function of the radius and try to fit it, it might actually fit better a core than a cusp. And the reason that a lot of people in the field are very excited about this is because if dark matter has, has self interactions, especially at the highest density points, is going to kind of have a very efficient heat transfer, push a lot of the dark matter out, build the core out of that cusp. There are a lot of complications though, which is I think kind of like the theme of this, of the way I do physics apparently. And in particular, the, the use of genes modeling which is how we actually get into get these density profiles here, as well as presence of binary sphericities and everything and a lot of other issues that I'm happy to discuss later. Anyway, so basically what Laura Chang at Princeton and I actually did a few months back is to take a look at the, uh, to have simulated um, density profiles or, or we simulated our own dwarf galaxies in the most simplest of cases. So isotropic, equilibrium, everything great. And then we applied this genes analysis that everybody applies in the literature with a lot of different statistics. So 20 stars, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. And you can see here that if you actually have a core, it might be harder to resolve with fewer statistics. Basically, also we, we, we wanted to tackle is the number of stars here. This is the posterior of the um, inner profile, gamma, where gamma equals zero means it's a core, one means it's a cusp. And also the effect of the measurement errors and how kind of basically here that you can't really tell anything, especially with large measurement errors, excuse me, unless you have 10,000 stars. It gets even worse if you have a smaller galaxy because it has a smaller dispersion. So we translate all of this into uh, a measurement of the J factor. And basically what we end up with is that we're overshooting the J factor unless we have a high enough number of stars in our measurement. We might be overestimating the J factor. Why does this matter? Well, because a lot of the measurements that we use in our in the literature um, in indirect detection actually do not have that many stars <laughs> like here. These are, you can see that these are the J factors that actually dominate the field. So, uh, and dominate the measurement because these are the highest ones and they don't have enough measurements here and the dispersions are actually quite small. So this is really more of a caution of that we need to to tackle these a lot better. And also we need a lot more data to be able to make a strong statement about this. And this is just like very briefly, once we understand the density profiles, we can take a look at, for example, dissipation in dark matter, which tends to be a lot cuspier than a CDM. And uh, a great student at Caltech, Jacob Chen is actually working on, hopefully we'll get this paper out in a couple of months to try to understand the presence of cusps and dwarfs um, 
and also he's also tackling the same problem in uh, Milky Way like galaxies. Um, and especially, for example, would we form this thin dark disk that Lisa Randall and collaborators have talked about for a while. Okay, I tried to speed up towards the end, but basically <laughs> what I wanted to kind of show you today is that stars are important and they can have huge implications for our understanding of dark matter. And what I discussed is basically how we can use stars in three different situations and three different examples to have a better understanding of the space-based distribution of dark matter and how that can, that can affect our experiments. Thank you. Thanks. I invite people to either uh, unmute and clap or virtually clap. Thank you. Uh, that, that was a really nice talk. Thank you, Lena. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions, so... Yes, and talk very fast, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 th th this is great. Uh, please just raise your hand, write something in the chat, unmute yourself and interrupt. Uh, I see that there's a question from Larry uh, in the chat. Does your analysis of escape speed say something about the circular speeds at the sun? You seem to favor a lower Milky Way mass. However, the values of V-circ have been creeping up. Oh, yes, that's a good point. Um, to actually get the measure, the measurement of the mass, uh, we have to kind of take the intersection of both measurements, so the escape velocity, as well as the circular velocity at the location of the sun. Uh, the reason for it is because the escape velocity tells you about the potential at very high distances versus the circular velocity tells you about the inner part of the, of the, um, uh, the inner part of the potential. So you end up in, in mass versus density, you end up with actually two bands. Uh, I do have the plot, <laughs> which I can pull up in a little bit if it's not clear, but basically we need the intersection of two measurements to be able to narrow down that mass. And this takes into account the new circular velocity measurement. Actually, uh, the one that I use is from Christina Eilers 2019, uh, and it's 230 kilometers a second plus or minus 10 kilometers a second. Did that answer your question? Um, I think so. I guess, um, you know, if someone came along with a measurement uh, that was somewhat higher, would that push your value up, down? I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how the covariance goes between those two. Oh, yes. So if the measurement of the circular velocity goes up, uh, I was basically writing the draft this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so staring at the slot, I can tell you very quickly. Yeah, if the circular velocity goes higher, the mass, the actual mass is going to get lower. Um, uh, yes, and it's actually going to, so the escape velocity error is actually quite small. What, let me, let me just show you the plot. <laughs> I think it will make a lot more sense. Um, Uh, and from now on, I'll actually include it in the um, in the back share screen. Here we go. So here is the mass on the x-axis, and then the concentration on the y-axis. And this is the circular velocity, uh, the escape velocity measurement versus the circular velocity measurement. And you really need the intersection of both of them; otherwise, you you cannot break that degeneracy. So you can see that if the circular velocity kind of goes up um, in measurements, it's actually going to creep up here in a higher concentration. It's, a, it's going to be a more concentrated uh, Milky Way with a lower mass. And this makes sense because the circular velocity at the, the position of the sun really tells you about the inner part of the potential. Does that help? Uh, yep, that helps. And, and if I could just add just one quick um... Uh, question, it seems like one of the next big things from Gaia is going to be the local acceleration of the sun mm. and then maybe mapping uh, an acceleration field as well as the velocity field. So we're going from kinematics to dynamics. I just wonder if you're thinking about that at all. It, it just seems to be a little, you know, a growing, a growth industry now in, in Gaia physics. It's definitely growing. I have not actually tackled that problem yet. 
uh, but I, I know a lot of people who are, uh, and I think it would be quite interesting to actually see what they come up with. But yeah, I have not done that yet. Okay. Um, I might ask you a question then. Uh, when you were, uh, I guess it's the same topic. When when you had your comparison of the different oh, uh, yeah. Milky Way masses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You you said that your three hundred kilometer per second v min was the most robust. Yes. But I don't quite understand how that relates to the previous slide where. Oh, because I basically uh, uh, I perform a three function fit. Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'll I'll go back to the other <laughs> the, the other graph anyway. Uh, so. You can still see that there is still comments on the draft, <laughs> but yeah, here we go. Basically, this is what the data looks like. This is from the guy data. And if you fit it with a single function, which is what the most of the literature has been doing, you'll end up with something that looks like this, which is kind of like a bit of a mess. And, um, and a lot, to be fair, a lot of the literature only looks at retrograde stars to kind of get rid of this discontamination. But we want to make sure that we have like the full thing. Uh, then, if you take and do a double two component, you have like one component which actually here I it's called I'm calling in the halo, but really that is the disk because it's like very low mass, um, uh, and it kind of drops right away. And but if you have it like with three different functions, you end up with a function that kind of fits that that and that. And of course. To do this a little bit more rigorously, we compute the AIC. Here we go. That kind of tells you that. So basically, the more negative it is, the better the fit. So AIC is three function compared to one function. That kind of tells you that if you have your V min of 300, the three function definitely is much, much better. And that kind of goes up. So at 375, you're favoring the single function fit. Does that make sense or am I going too fast? No, that makes a lot of sense actually. And this, this answers, uh, or at least partially answers my next question. Awesome. <laughs> which is, well, I, I guess this, this helps uh, get halfway there anyway. Um, you're including this extra sub halo stuff. Yeah. And here you're, you've, you're also adding a sausage component, which mm -hmm. um, is uh, doing something. But this is based on, kind of one observed structure that we have mm -hmm. and one kind of typical structure, but just based on looking at the sausage and Nick's and there, there are dozens of these other streams, right? That we see yes. and they all have kind of special shapes. That's I'm worried true. that that diversity is going to come in and, and mess up what you're doing here. Oh, that's a very good point. Um, so here, what you, so here we're actually just doing, um, yeah, a what we want is to really model just the tail of the distribution. So if I was modeling the full distribution, mm -hmm. then I will really need to understand a lot of these structures. The, yeah, so the reason that our study, I think, is the most robust is because we kind of do it at different vmin and make sure that everything kind of converges towards a single structure, which is what we expect. We have a different draft, like, it's actually a kind of a two paper series where the first one we actually studied this hectically to in mocks and basically in some in some of these mocks we also inject random structures at different velocities and try to figure out how we can how does this affect our results how can we kind of um, clean that up and the and basically the way that we do this now is by plots that kind of look like this if I have uh, this is the escape velocity, this is the min. Uh, if I have a single function fit or two function fit, you can see that eventually they need to converge over the same scale velocity because at the end of the day, when you have a high enough velocity it, like v min, you will be dominated by a single structure, whatever is really sitting at the, at the end of everything. And it's quite reassuring for us that we end up with this particular behavior. And the whole point that we're kind of really trying to address here is that all of this has to make physical sense. And this is, if you only do a single function fit to something that has a lot of structures, you're gonna end up with something very huge, like, you know, and, and really wrong. <laughs> uh, well, 
uh, as you push to higher and higher minimum velocities, things should convert to the right place. And here, what I'm plotting is actually the slope. So the way that people, you haven't seen this in the literature, and the reason for it is because they put in artificial uh, priors on K and they limit K to from like one to 2.5 or something uh, here. And I have a lot of issues with that because you can't just, you can't just set up random priors, <laughs> even if you justify them with cosmological simulations, which a lot of people do. It's just basically your fit is not convergent and that's not the right way to do things. Um, and, and as long as things kind of converge as you go up, even with fewer statistics, which is why the errors kind of go higher at higher, higher VNIN, then yeah, things will make sense. So what are the three curves on the, on this bottom plot? Uh, sorry, yes. So here, if I was fitting with a single function, this is the posterior of the k velocity. Um, and, uh, here, and if I was fitting with two functions, we have the same one escape velocity. And the panel here, if I was fitting with two functions, then I will end up with two, two k's, or two k distributions, this light red and this high red uh, here and here. And then uh, while for the single function, I'll have a single distribution of k. So yeah, this, this paper will be in your archive near you in hopefully two, three weeks. <laughs> uh, Joe has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks. Really nice talk. I, I was wondering, what is the physical origin of this outlier population? Is that something that's entirely data driven? Is it partly data driven and partly something you're putting in? Yeah. Can I think about? Yeah, good. No, it's a good question. Um, so, yeah, some of it, some of these are actually, you might think of as badly measured stars. So, that is a fact. We do take into account like the, the measurement errors that we have, but of course, we, you know, Sometimes that might be off. Um, some of them are unbound stars. So just like stars zipping right through and they're not gonna be bound and they're just gonna keep going. Uh, some of them are accreted, basically coming through mergers, but also some of them are, you know, coming, sometimes kind of they get knocked out of the, uh, of the disk of the Milky Way through very close encounters or, you know, a lot of them also kind of sometimes if they get too close to the black hole at the center, they kind of get kicked out. And, uh, at very high velocities. And the, that's the outlier population that we end up looking at. Okay, yeah, because I, I guess for, for some of those things, you should expect the stellar component to match the dark matter component. Yeah. Um, yeah, like the close encounters with maybe the black hole to center of the Milky Way, then it makes sense that they're both doing the same thing. But then for others, you'd expect them to be doing something different. So I guess there's a teasing apart of those two. Uh, like if, yeah. if I have just a star encountering another star, I mean, depending right. on what the dark matter is, then yeah. So yeah, so the here, so for kind of like the first section, yeah, trying to understand like the full distributions and looking at the structures that actually have an accreted origin, right? Like coming from mergers, because for example, the disk of the Milky Way has nothing to do with dark matter whatsoever. Like that's, that's why these are stars that we really need to kind of get rid of, um, at least in our analysis. Here though, for the escape velocity, the escape velocity tells you about the total potential of the Milky Way. So if you can model, for example, like, okay, this is the disk contribution, this is the bulge contribution, the rest of it should be the dark matter contribution. So here, we're not really looking at the distributions uh, or trying to match the distributions from, you know, uh, the stars to the dark matter, but rather trying to understand like the potential as a whole and what can we, um, uh, what can we tell about like the full dark matter potential from that. Right, but if I could just ask about that for a question. Yeah, I totally agree. For for most of the dark matter component, that's that's what should be driving the high velocity mm -hmm. component. But is it silly to think about one of these structures accreting and maybe if it's instead of co-rotating, if it's anti-rotating, then something like the escape velocity of that structure um, convolved oh. with uh, like sort of the Milky Way gives you a, a really high velocity component you wouldn't expect otherwise, or is that is that not something? To oh, that's about? a very good question. Yeah, so you would, so it depends on the time of the merger. Right, I think this is the whole point. So you have, if the merger happened a long time in like long enough that the potential kind of has settled, these two different structures will have the same escape velocity. And this is what the, one of the assumptions that we're making here. Um, in earlier analysis, we actually did try to tackle multiple escape velocities. So basically they have different tails and different escape velocities, but the, the problem is that the 
we have very, very little data to disentangle that. There will be like too many parameters, but you're right. There's absolutely one limitation. For the Gaia sausage, for example, we do escape, we do expect it to kind of have the potential of it settled. So that would not be something that is kind of like zipping right through like right now because it has merged in prior to Redshift 1. Um, so it's an, an, it has been enough time that kind of like the potential has settled. But yeah, for smaller structures or, or younger structures, things that have happened more recently, then we do expect them to be kind of driving up at the tail. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, there, I did get a question in the chat from a student just asking about error analysis and mm -hmm. what you're, what you're doing there. I guess in terms of the Gaia data, if you're doing anything. Oh, specific to uh, yeah. which which part of the time? <laughs> so, yeah, for for all of the above, actually, yeah. Yeah, for all of the above of the Gaia data, we actually convolve everything with the error, with the measurement errors that we have. Um, as you know, Gaia is actually very good at measuring proper motions with very small errors. Uh, a lot of the errors, unfortunately, are driven by the distance measurements. Uh, this is not so, so bad for very close by stars, which is what we have. Things do get a little bit worse the further we get. Um, uh, Gaia EDR3, the one that got published in December, actually tackled a lot of like their parallax measurements and have improved. Um, they, I have not kind of updated all of this because it takes forever to run, <laughs> but um, there will be sm very small differences. Um, with Gaia DR, the full DR3, I think that will be quite a, like very, very good measurements and more importantly, a lot more data. So. To answer the question, we do take into account the errors, uh, but I think we're more driven by statistics at this point. Okay. Um, so we do have time for one or two more questions. Um, I suggest we we do our second traditional applause. Uh, <laughs> but if so, if, if people have uh, obligations, you're free to leave um, because I was keeping you right. Uh, but we'll stick around for a little bit in case you want to discuss a little bit more. Thanks, everyone.